lecture number 10, the last lecture in the course of 10 lectures where we discuss project management from a perspective of PMBOK, Project Management Body of Knowledge, which was published a few decades ago and uh, which has a number of versions. So we are discussing in these lectures the version number five. There are also versions uh, six, version seven, which is the current one, and the version, the version four, which, for example, I was certified against. So when I was learning PMBOK, I was focused mostly on, on version number four. And this uh, stakeholder management uh, process area was introduced in the version number five. So this is uh, a little bit new for me. And I, I learned it after I uh, finished the certification. And what's interesting is that in version six and version seven, they changed the structure of PMBOK dramatically so now they don't have these chapters they don't have the chapter on uh, stakeholder management they don't have a chapter on cost management scope management and uh, it means i will probably have to uh, maybe in the future have another course which is going to be about PMBOK version 7 the new understanding of project management how they present it but in my opinion version 5 is pretty uh, pretty good it was pretty good and it still does make sense to me so we will discuss stakeholder management the final chapter uh, it's about how we deal with people who are now involved in the project who we need to make happy and who we sometimes are scared of because the project not necessarily always produce uh, good things uh, no matter what you think about it no matter what you do you always or almost always but i think always will make somebody unhappy even if you build a new medicine a new pill which will cure cancer for example you're still going to make doctors unhappy uh, so it doesn't matter what kind of uh, great contribution you make to humanity some people will be unhappy the doctors who are busy right now curing cancer they will be super unhappy because you 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 make them uh, lose their jobs they will have no jobs anymore you just people will just buy this pill on the uh, in the in the drugstore just take it and the cancer is gone so what the doctors will do you the doctors will definitely try to well some of them will maybe not all of them but some of them will definitely try to prevent your project from being successful so these are the stakeholders. So all the parties, all the people who somehow will be affected by the project results, they're called stakeholders. So as usual, we start with the questions, eight questions. Take your notebooks and start writing the answers. In the end of the lecture, you will see the right answers. Question number one. Uh, HR director tells you that you have to spend your entire day on the important security training while the project milestone is approaching and you're behind schedule so imagine this is your project you're working in it you have some schedule and then hr manager comes from a different department and tells you that you have to uh, to go and spend some time on important training about security which is important for the organization maybe it's not important for your project but it's important for the entire organization so what do you do the first answer you refuse to attend the training because you're you're doing something important for the project Second, you attend the training. So you forget about the schedule, forget about the milestone. And you go to the important security training. That's second option. Option three, you find a better job. That may sound sarcastic, but it's still an option. If something like this happens in the organization, you may think that this is not a good organization because they have a conflict of interest between themselves. So clearly, you now have two stakeholders. Think about it. That one stakeholder is your project manager. Another stakeholder is your HR director. Two stakeholders. And option four, you change the schedule. So you work with the schedule of the project and you try to accommodate the changes somehow. So to make the schedule maybe longer because you have this uh, situation. Pick one. Second question, you develop a Java framework, which is a trademark of Oracle Corporation. Um, a Java software, you're making a Java software for your diploma project. You're a student, so you make a diploma project and you write code in Java. Which stakeholder doesn't belong to this list? So you see four stakeholders. So which line do you think does not belong to the list according to some criteria? I'm not saying you what is the criteria because that would be easy to answer if I would tell it, if I would say uh, which is the criteria. But imagine what is the criteria, try to find it and exclude the, 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 the stakeholder from the list. All of them are stakeholders. All of them are somehow 
Um, they, they may be called stakeholders. So pick one. Question three, a programmer from another project comes to you asking to help them in their project. So they're working in another project, in another department, maybe on another, another floor of your uh, enterprise building. So what do you do? You help them. Second one, you help them, but in free time, when you have free time. Option three, you refuse. You focus on your own project. And option, th option four, you ask your team leader what to do. Because again, of a conflict of interests. Pick one. Option four, you just joined, uh, question four, you just joined the company. They gave you a workspace, a computer, but didn't tell you what to do. What do you do? So they just told you that you sit here, you work here, this is your computer, just go ahead. But one day, next day, three days, no instructions, no job description, no, no task, nothing is given to you. So what do you do? First, you just sit and wait. Maybe something will happen. Option two, you ask your boss to give you a task. So you approach the boss and says, what do you do? What do I do? What's my, what's my task? Option three, you write some code for GitHub, just for your own project. They don't tell you what to do. You just do what you, what you can do, which is your own pet project. And option four, you start looking for a second job. Also may sound sarcastic, but maybe it's an option. So you start looking for another job, not another, but a second job. So they don't tell you what to do. Okay. You're going to do something else in the time, which is free. Uh, question five, your team develops a crypto software. Which one is the least dangerous stakeholder? The least dangerous. So the stakeholder, which may uh, cause the smallest amount of trouble to your project. So the impact which may be given to the project by the stakeholder, a negative impact, is the lowest, least dangerous. You have a friend who knows what you're doing, who, who maybe lives together with you, your, your teammate, your, your roommate, your friend. Second option is the government of the country, uh, which, which is the government. Option three, it's an HR department in the company. And option four, it's Amazon Web Services, where you keep your servers. So which one is the least dangerous? Question six, what we care least of all, what we care least of all about a stakeholder. So what information is the least, the, 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 um, the least, can I say the least important? Uh, what information? <laughs> okay. What, <laughs> I don't know. Let's say the least important. Uh, what do we don't care about? We care. We, we may care about the interest of a stakeholder. We may care about the influence which the stakeholder may may have on us. We may care about the legitimacy of a, a legitimacy of a stakeholder. Uh, so whether they have legitimate requirements, whether they they are they have legal uh, instruments and means to affect us, and the location where they are located. They are close to us. They're another country, and so on and so forth. So what? part of this list, which one is uh, not important or the least important. Question seven, a client gets hysterical and demands project termination. Most probably what did you do wrong? Imagine you are the project manager. First, you didn't hire the right people. Second, you didn't push programmers strong enough. Three, you didn't report status regularly, status of the project. You didn't report it to the customer. Option four, you didn't invite the client to project meetings. And the client is a stakeholder, obviously. One of the most, uh, the most frequently seen in projects is the customer. So pick one. What did you do wrong? Because the stakeholder now is angry, hysterical. He demands the project termination, which happens so many times. I'm, I'm sure you, you have already seen that and you will definitely see it in your career where people who are customers, they get angry at some point of time and they demand you to stop working with the project, refund me, give me the money back, I'm going to sue you, I'm going to go to court because you, uh, you totally unsatisfied my requirements and all that. So what was the most, what was most probably, what did you do wrong? Uh, question eight, when actively listening to a complaint of a client, what do you do most? So the client, again, it's a stakeholder. The stakeholder complains. The stakeholder is not happy about what's going on. And, 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 and they start talking to you in, in a usually aggressive manner. You, you want to do what when you listen in order to probably 
put the conversation in the, as constructive uh, direction as possible. First, you smile to show that you are uh, a friendly person, maybe. Option two, you agree. I agree with what you're saying. Uh, option three, you explain back what's happening. So, you know, to help them understand or you ask questions. It's also, uh, it's also a possibility. So let's start with the question one and I'll give you the right answers, which are my subjective interpretation of these situations. Of course, there are no right answers or wrong answers, as I told you in the previous lectures, but some answers um, I like more than others. Um, question one. Now it's time for you to ask questions because I see that you were asking before, but that was just a quick, uh, quick run through all the questions. So no, through, through all the, my questions, but now it's time for your questions. So if you have them, just go ahead, shoot and ask them. Um, HR director tells you that you have to spend your entire day on an important. So we have two stakeholders in this case, there are two parties, two organizational groups to two people, maybe who are uh the people who may cause troubles to your projects or they may help this is the definition of a stakeholder a stakeholder is somebody an organization a person uh, a government maybe somebody who you don't even know what's the name of that entity they may either help you in this case we call them positive stakeholder or they may cause troubles to you we call them negative stakeholder the job of a project manager is to identify these stakeholders as soon as possible in the beginning of the project. And when the project moves forward, the job of a project manager is to keep this list of stakeholders up to date. So you constantly have to know who are the stakeholders. The, one of the biggest mistakes you can make in your project, it is close to the mistake we discussed in the risk management, when you don't pay attention to certain risk, when you don't identify a risk. That's a huge mistake. Another big mistake, if you don't identify a stakeholder. So you just didn't know that somebody in your organization actually may help you or somebody in your organization actually doesn't want this project to succeed. So you may spend a lot of time developing something, creating some beautiful software, and in the end, your project will just fail. It will not be accepted. It will not get uh, integrated. It will because somebody who you didn't know was against it from the first day and you was blind. You were not, you were not uh, attentive enough. You were not careful enough to ask people around and to identify stakeholders. How do you identify? You just ask people around. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's impossible to identify who is that guy who really doesn't want me to succeed. So your job is to know who they are and then try to turn negative stakeholders into positive stakeholders and try to uh, encourage the positive stakeholders to give you as much support as you can. So that's the, that's what I think project manager, uh, aside from, like we discussed, aside, though, aside from collecting information about what's going on in the project and predicting the future, the project manager should be the guy who communicates with the stakeholders and tries to, uh, tries to understand their needs and tries to understand their, uh, their interests. So here we have two stakeholders. One is your, definitely your, like, uh, uh, maybe your boss who is on top of you, or it could be not the boss, but maybe uh, some sort of a client who may be a client inside the organization or outside of the organization. That's like one person. And you have another person who is the HR director who, who doesn't care about the success of your project, who doesn't care about your schedule, who doesn't care about your milestones. He doesn't, he, let's say, let's, he's a guy. So he doesn't, um, he doesn't uh, really, it doesn't really matter for him whether your deadline will, will, will be met or not. He only cares about security training because if you do something uh, wrong uh, security wise, for example, you didn't pass the training, you didn't sign the paper that, yes, I know that the secrets are in this room and this room is not supposed to be entered any time of the day. And then you didn't sign this paper. And then sometime you enter this room and you steal some information from there, then the whole company will try to, to sue you, will try to, uh, to legally, uh, you know, collect some, some, some punishment from you, some, maybe some money. And the, the organization will not be able to do that because the HR director failed to do the proper security training with you on time. So maybe 
Let's think about it. Maybe the security training is even really is really more important than your milestone. Because in this question, we didn't say what's more important. We didn't say that your project is also super important for the organization. So maybe this this schedule with you, uh, the project milestone, maybe it's something really small and you're working on some tiny project who not so many people care about. But security training, it's super important. So we need to find a balance. So what's what's more? So answering this or that is wrong because you don't know the, uh, you're not the person to decide what's the, uh, what's the right balance between these two stakeholders? So probably it's, well, this one maybe is a possible answer because if this situation happens and and uh, HR director tells you, doesn't tell your boss, but it tells you. So that's a clear misbalance of, of uh, it's, it's a clear misorganization in the company. So if the HR director comes to you and you didn't know about this upfront, so it was not this information was not available when you were building the schedule, then it's a it's a failure of the organization because the stakeholder was not identified before. So you just you just didn't know. So this surprise, you should you you have all the well, probably you have all the rights to say that uh, I'm not going to attend the meeting because I. Yeah, because you didn't tell me about it before. It's not inside my plan. But we don't do this because, because, like I said, the importance may be very high. So find another job. It's not. It's not so funny. Actually, it's not really a, a, a so funny answer. It is a quite possible answer. The organization is uh, is pretty chaotic. This is probably the right answer. So this is no, this is no, this is no. So probably change the schedule. So try to change your schedule according to the information you just received. In order to change the schedule, you will have to talk to both stakeholders. You will have to find some sort of a, not a compromise, but some sort of an agreement between them. And, uh, and, uh, and what kind of agreement is going to be, that depends on many factors, which we don't know right now. But you need to put them somehow together, these two stakeholders. I'm giving you this question to demonstrate that stakeholders may be in conflict between each other. So here, maybe when you start talking to them, and if you maybe if you sit together on, on, in one meeting with them and ask them both what they think about this, then maybe you will see a pretty strong confrontation between these people. So maybe they don't like each other. Maybe they have very opposite uh, understandings of, uh, of what's good and what's bad for the organization. Maybe the HR director believes that everything that your boss is doing in your projects is just a waste of time and maybe hr director believes that you guys should be doing something else so there are many could be many many uh, ins and outs there could be many uh, possible uh, interesting bits of information you're gonna get when you talk to them so your job is to some sort of a see the conflicts between the stakeholders and if you can win in this conflict because you are the person who who is so, some sort of a peacemaker in this case, because you are not this guy and you're not that guy. So they have their own interests and you seeing that they have different interests may somehow play uh, a game and, and get something for yourself. For example, I mean, you can play a, a fair game or you can play a, a dirty game. For example, you see that HR director is uh, interested in the, in the trainings and you see that this guy uh, doesn't understand what it is and cannot actually fight against the HR director because the HR director may be, let's say, maybe of the higher position than this than your boss, then you can tell your boss that that trainings are super important and they will take more time than than even than even required. And then you will just get free day for you, something like that. So you can you can you know extend the, the schedule and get more free time and get more uh slack or what they call them more um more free more 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 uh, uh, or freedom for you in the planning if you can attack your boss using the hands and the, 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 using the, the HR director. So that, that kind of games we constantly play by looking at who are the stakeholders and, and letting them fight with, between each other in order to get something for us. Second question, you develop a Java uh, software uh, which is your diploma project, diploma or course project, and which the stakeholder doesn't belong to this list. So that's a tricky question. And uh, I think that here we have um, stakeholders and, and the, I, would, I would apply the criteria for this list, which I would call 
whether the stakeholder is positive or negative. So let's see who are they. Oracle. Oracle is a company who most probably doesn't know anything about your pet project, about your diploma work. They probably don't care, probably. But still, if you do Java development, it's good for Oracle. You contribute to the development of their ecosystem. They are the authors of Java. You're not making a, a C Sharp software, which would be good for Microsoft ecosystem. So this is a positive stakeholder. University. The university will be will benefit if your diploma work actually succeeds. So if you pass the diploma, if you if you get the grade, if you if you create a good software, if you create something which will be uh, useful for other people, maybe you will even write some article about this software. Maybe you will do some research on top of this software. So they are also positive stakeholders. The university is positively looking for this. The university wants you to succeed. Your professor. The professor definitely wants you to succeed. The professor hopes that your diploma will be a, not a failure, but will be a, 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 a result. It's also a positive stakeholder. Microsoft, on the other hand, is a negative stakeholder. Microsoft will only suffer if your diploma work is a success, because Microsoft wants you to do C sharp programming, not Java programming. So you're doing so if imagine your diploma work is a huge work and Microsoft one day will find out that you are doing this, then Microsoft may approach you and may start to convince you to stop doing Java development and start doing C sharp development. So they are negative stakeholders. So the right answer is this. Just this is the classification positive and negative. You can imagine how many more stakeholders we can think of for any small project, your diploma work, I don't know, you want to go to a movie with your friends. Think about how many stakeholders this small project involves. The cinema, the producer of the cinema, the government, your parents, your other friends, your university, your professor. All of these people somehow are affected by your decision to go and see a movie with two friends. Your professor doesn't like it because you're not doing diploma work at this time. Or maybe the professor at the same time like it if your diploma work is going going well and the professor believes that you need to take some rest the maker of the movie who made that movie they care about this uh, th that you attending the movie not personally you but in general they care about people who are gonna watch and and, and what gonna go and watch the movie all the actors of the movie they also are stakeholders because when you watch the movie if you have some positive uh, opinion about the movie then and so on and so forth so my point here is that when you're looking for stakeholders, you need to look in a very broadly. You need to look, you have to be very openly, very open in your imagination. So who are these people? And if you are open, if you imagine more than even exists, then you will be able to see the people who are hiding, who are not willing to be seen, who don't want them uh, to be visible for, for people like you. In the organization, you start a project, Start looking for people around. Who are they? Who care about my existence? Who will benefit? Like in this example, the Microsoft. Probably you didn't think about it. I'm just doing diploma work in Java. Microsoft, why do they care? They do. They don't care about you personally, but in general, if you would be, if that would be a big project, you would definitely need to put the Microsoft in the list of stakeholders. And your job is to turn negative stakeholder into positive one. You need to think, wait, what can I do for Microsoft that Microsoft will also be interested in my project to succeed? Because right now, Microsoft wants me to fail. And we don't want to fail. So we, we want to turn their interest upside down. How? Maybe let's inject some small C-sharp piece of software inside our diploma. Or maybe let's write some, some paper, the, the, the summarization of this work, where we compare Java and, Java and C-sharp. That will somehow contribute to the development of C-sharp ecosystem because people will know about C-sharp. That's what uh, Microsoft wants. Yeah, that's a good, good, coming, uh, good suggestion. Use uh, some Microsoft uh, AI product, the Bing or whatever. So just use something from Microsoft. That that's how you throw a bone to them. So you you you're gonna start liking you. That's a that's a funny example because Microsoft is not gonna care about you anyway. But on a smaller example, on a smaller scale, that's this is what happens in the company. Let's say you have an HR director. HR director, like I told you, doesn't care about the success of your project. Turn it upside down. 
meet with the HR director and tell him that when the project succeeds, you're going to write an, a summary report where you're going to mention HR director as a person who contributed to the success of the project. Some sort of a bribe, but it doesn't, it may look like a bribe, but if you do it in a positive way, if you really get some contribution from him, then he may apparently start liking what you're doing and start helping you. And having a help, it doesn't hurt. It only helps you. It's only going to make your project more successful. So find those stakeholders and uh, encourage them to help you. Question three, a programmer from another project comes to you asking to help them in their project. That's a very typical situation. You have a team, you're sitting in one office, you're working on something, and they're coming from another, from another room and saying, hey guys, you know Java, that's great. We have some Java questions. Can you help us? And you openly, well, most of you, start helping them. It's not really the right, uh, the right um, reaction to this situation. Because again, there are two stakeholders. You have your boss, who is the boss of you, so that's you. And you have these guys who are coming from, I don't know how many of them, so they're coming from another department, and they're asking to help. So you obviously need to understand who you're gonna make happy and who you will make unhappy. So when you help one stakeholder, I'm, I'm giving this question to demonstrate uh, to demonstrate uh, this problem that uh, making like satisfying the interests and satisfying the needs of one stakeholder, you inevitably, in most cases, inevitably sacrifice the relationship with another stakeholder or many other stakeholders. Like in this case, the boss will absolutely not happy if you if you help these people, you know, very frequently or maybe even once. I can speak for myself. If I'm the boss and I have people working with me in my team, and then I know that these people start helping some other department, maybe we are competitors with these guys. Maybe I am in some ranking system, which, which will, which will, because the boss is here. Maybe there's another boss, well, most probably, who stays on top of us. And this boss decides by the end of the year who was more successful, uh, me or the other department. So in this case, I don't want you to help them. Well, I actually want you to not help them. I want you to not even talk to them. But you don't know about this. You have no, we don't have this information because you only communicate with me. So you are my, my subordinate. And, and who is my boss? You don't, well, you, know, you may know, but you don't care about it. So this relationship may be hidden from you. So your job in this case will help them that's definitely not an option because you having no information, you just jump into helping somebody, causing troubles to another stakeholder. Help them, but in free time. Well, this is a bit better, but still, this free time, if I'm your boss, I expect you to rest in your free time. I expect you to be prepared for the next work day. I expect you to go to the movie and, and watch a movie with your friends, but don't spend your free time helping some other people. And, and I, like I said, maybe these people are my enemies, so I don't want you to help them. Basically, I want you to uh, to not even talk to them because if it's a if it's a competition inside the organization, so this is also not a good option. Refuse focus on your own project. Mm, well, this is quite rude because in this case you make an enemy for no reason. Basically, they came to you, ask for help, and you just refuse. So maybe tomorrow you will come to them and ask for help from them. From them, you you can uh, you can uh, you can see what's going to happen. Uh, and maybe we're friends. I mean, I'm your boss. You're working for, in my team. Another team came to you asking for help. You refuse them. But maybe these guys are my friends. Maybe we, I want them to succeed. You don't do this. You don't make this decision without asking me, without talking to me, to your, to your leader. You first come to your leader and ask, and ask whether these people are positive stakeholders or negative stakeholders. So tell me, you ask your leader, what to do. Should I help them? Or should I refuse? Or should I do it in free time? Or what should I do? That's my, that's my question. That's what I would ask my, my leader. So this is all about subordination. In a company, you, mm, the most crucial, the most important rule which you should remember in order to get success in an organization is the principle of subordination. It means that you don't make decisions without your boss. You don't make decisions on your own unless the territory, the, the responsibility area where the decisions are made 
were given to you by your by your boss. So if the boss told him told you that this is where you make the decisions, this is your responsibility, then you act there without informing your boss. You just know what what needs to be done. You know how to achieve uh, the results which the boss is expecting, and this is your territory of responsibility. But as soon as some contacts appear, some some communications start with people outside of this territory of responsibility, with people outside of your uh, of hierarchy of subordination, you immediately uh, involve your boss. You immediately uh, re escalate this uh, escalate this problem to higher level of management. So this is what uh, this is what uh, uh, this is what many people mm, fail when they work in organizations, and this is what uh, causes trouble in career development when they act independently, when they act as if everything is their responsibility, as if whatever happens with them, it's their life, it's their responsibility. It's not true. In an organization, you are part of a, of a large mechanism, you're part of a large hierarchy. And if you support the, the, the principle of hierarchical management, the principle of subordination, the principle of subordination means that, uh, that uh, uh, I'm trying to formulate that. Uh, so if, if you are my boss, Let's put the other way around, so maybe it will be easier to explain. So you're my boss, I work for you. So I know that... Uh, uh, so my primary objective is to, uh, to fight for your interests. So you are my primary stakeholder. So my job is to do what makes you successful. This is probably uh, the, 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 the bottom line of what is uh, subordination. So I work for, for your success. I make you happy. I make you not happy, but successful. Not necessarily always happy, but successful. So I understand in the organization, I ask you, first of all, I ask you, you're my boss. So I ask you, what do you need to, to happen? What do you need me to do? What do I, how do I contribute to your success? And, and you tell me, you explain what needs to be done. So I do it as much as I can using all my instruments, my tools, my energy, everything. And if I see that something is uh, coming from the, from the other places, which I don't know whether will contribute to your success, or maybe it won't, will contribute to your failure. Like in this example, some people came to me asking something. I don't know whether you want me to help them or you don't want. In this case, I ask the question again. I ask you whether this this activity which you which you want me to do will help or not. So this is the principle of subordination. So I constantly my my job in the organization is to contribute to the success of my uh, of my boss. And of course you have to have one boss. But many organizations they they don't understand the the subordination as it, as it should be in a classic in a classic way. And they even try to convince people that this is very uh, very trendy right now that that subordination is something from the past is something that we should uh, get away from so we are for uh, so-called flat organizations where we don't have the bosses we just we're all friends so there are like people have only horizontal connections so there are no hierarchy it's just everybody helps everybody but i don't believe in this i believe that this is just uh, uh this is just um uh, a veil uh, a front for what's really happening so we can of course sell this idea to people and tell them that yes we don't have hierarchies we don't have bosses but in reality we do and if you really don't have it then the organization will not survive it's impossible to imagine people working to helping each other and having no understanding of uh, of of, uh, of subordination having no understanding of um, uh, of the existence of negativity in people. So it's impossible to imagine everybody likes everybody and everybody wants everybody to be successful. It's not possible. It's just, it's just uh, fundamentally wrong to believe in this. So we do have negative stakeholders and we do have positive ones. And usually the negative stakeholders are in the, major in the majority. So, but the flat organizations, they just tell us that there are no negative stakeholders. Like everybody wants to help you. Every but you can imagine that in real life it's it's not it's very far from 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 what's happening in the reality so hierarchies and subordination helps us to survive surrounded by negative stakeholders 
we must survive we not we must be successful while other people are uh, not so positive about our activities like i told you i give you i gave an example with the with the cancer pill with the medicine which will help uh, to cure cancer imagine how many negative stakeholders you're going to get if your if your department start starts developing that imagine look at this story which happened to open ai just a few weeks ago with the ceo of e, of ai the good company they're making some good product they're making something which helps so many people right now in the world they're moving civilization dramatically forward and they fired the ceo so probably the ceo didn't see the negative stakeholders uh, in time he didn't pay attention he didn't understand who is against him and there are many people against him so many people around this organization they're trying to uh, to destroy the organization not to help the organization but to destroy and the right way to survive this uh, this negativity is to stick to subordination principles so help your contribute to success of your boss the boss will contribute to success of his boss or her boss and then up and up and up and if everybody will work like this it will be a very strong pyramid very strong organization where everybody knows how to help uh, how to contribute to success of higher levels of higher levels and this organization is the most healthy organizations but of course in order to work like this the organization the people in the organization they have to uh, know how to share their objectives their interests with the lower levels so you if you are my boss you have to explain to me what contribution you expect from me and many people cannot explain it properly many people are afraid of telling the truth many people are uh, like incapable of formulating what really needs to be done so many many things are personal the personal drawbacks of, of personalities but if you find the boss who can clearly tell you what needs to be done in order to make him successful because most bosses they will tell you we need to develop this project we need to make this successful product we need to uh, write very good code while it doesn't matter for him for his career development for his career development for example what matters is that in another department they make unsuccessful projects this is what makes a difference so he maybe doesn't care whether the quality of our code is high maybe he doesn't care whether we actually uh, make something useful and maybe whether it's going to be installed anywhere whether whether going to be customers there he doesn't care about this he only cares that, that this department next door fails but he will be afraid to tell you this he will not tell you this openly because because of many reasons so your job as a as an employee is to fetch this information from your boss to to talk to your boss to ask questions to understand what is the real interest what i need to be i don't know maybe i need to go to to the next door and maybe i don't know break the lock on the door so that they cannot enter the door for the next for the next day and this is how we achieve success because they will fail it's a joke but it's not far away from the from the truth maybe your job is not to write the code but to cause troubles to the people next door so your boss has to tell you about this of course it's not a healthy organization if this is the objective if this is the, the real interest of your of your boss but believe me very often this is the real objective this is the real uh need of the boss let's go to the next question um Question number four, you joined the company, they gave you the workplace, the computer, the, but they didn't tell you what to do. It's a very typical situation. They just don't know what to do. They have no uh, management uh, instruments. They have no management uh, formula. It's very typical. They just, just sit there and work. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you need to, in this case, this is the indicator of chaos. So you got into organization which is chaotic so which is managed in a bad way so it means that your first step is to identify who are the stakeholders who you should work for so who do you work for obviously in this organization there are no so far there are no stakeholders who need something to be done who want you to contribute to their success it's close to the previous question so here you don't see the boss you don't see who you should contribute to that person doesn't exist maybe that person exists but will show up later but now he's absent so just sit and wait i don't think it's a good decision because in this case you contribute to nobody to no stakeholder there's no it's just waste of your time so definitely no another answer ask your boss to give you a task 
ask your boss. In this case, you are, you, it may be a good answer. So you try, you, you will try to find who's, well, first of all, you will have to find the boss, which is maybe not so easy in, in the organizations because now it says they gave you. So there will be, there, there were somebody, some, some people gave you the computer. And usually these people are just administrative personnel. So they are just uh, not the boss, but the people with the computers, the people with the rights to connect you to the network. So they gave you the computer. But that's not the people who you should contribute to. So finding a boss will also take some time for you, but maybe it's not a good option. So let's consider it for, for now. Option number three, write some code for GitHub. In my opinion, it's better because you're not looking for a stakeholder. You already have the stakeholder who are, let's say, your, your, your future boss who will be very happy you will change the boss. This organization is not forever. You're going to stay in this organization for a few years, like most of us. And then you change the organization. You get, you get to another place and you work for somebody else. So that somebody else is also a stakeholder, but in the future, but already exists. You just don't know him, but he already exists. Let's say it's a, it's a, it's a he. So we, we, we you can start contributing to his success. How? by making yourself more professional, by writing some code on GitHub, for example. You make that person successful and you make some GitHub users successful. So these are clearly two groups of positive stakeholders. You can contribute to them right now. You know them, you start working for them. When the boss here will show up, you can switch that situation. You can reorganize, reorganize your list of stakeholders and you start working for the boss who shows up. Maybe he will never show up. I've seen situations when the boss shows up in three months. It happened to me. Like three months, you do, you do something, but you don't know who is actually asking you to do something. Like nobody told you what's need to be done. You just found out that this is what the organization is doing. And you understand that in order to stay in this organization, in order to not make anybody super unhappy, you just need to be visible in the office for, for the full working day. But they don't care what you do. In this case, of course, sit and wait is not an option. So, and asking and, and start looking for the boss, you may find the wrong boss. You may find somebody, if you start looking for, for the boss, you may find a wrong stakeholder. Somebody who, who will understand that you don't have the real boss, you don't have the real stakeholder, and they will immediately give you the task which is important for them, but not important for you, not important for your career, not important for your real boss, who will potentially show up in three months. So I suggest not to start, not to look for the boss. Just understand that the boss is hiding for some reason. Just wait for it. So I would think about this and maybe option number four is the best one. So instead of maybe making code for GitHub, just find another job, like a freelance job, which you can make extra money and make some extra contribution while this stakeholder is not interested in you so far. So if it's legally okay, because some companies may, uh, may disallow you to have a second, second job, but if it's legally okay, according to the contract you just signed, then find another job and you have two jobs and this one, they don't need any contribution for you, but you will find another one where your contribution will be uh, appreciated. And I, and I've seen these situations a number of times where people work in two positions in two jobs. They're very fast. They, they can write code fast. They, they can make uh, successful two stakeholders at the same time instead of one. So why not making two times money than, uh, than, than just once? That's a, not a bad answer. Question five, your team develops a crypto software. Which one is the least dangerous stakeholder? Least danger. So let's try to measure the, the danger, the, the amount of impact, the amount of influence, which these people, may, these organizations may have on your, on your company. Um, the least possible dangerous. So, um, a friend, friend, is it a positive stakeholder or a negative stakeholder? We can consider a friend, both a positive stakeholder or a negative stakeholder depends on the friend depends on the, on the many, many factors. So if let's say a friend works in a competing, in a competing, uh, in a competitor company, then definitely a friend is a negative stakeholder. Or maybe a friend is your roommates who, who, who would love to see you successful and that's a, a positive stakeholder. So we don't know. So we cannot say that this is the least dangerous. Definitely not. A government. A government, well, we can't say that the government wants us to be successful, but in reality, it's the opposite. So the government is, is the government in general exists 
to uh, to prevent bad things to happen in the society. Because the good things, we don't need the government to, to for the good things to happen. If all the people were good, then the government would not exist. We just would live a happy life because we're all are good. But because bad intentions and the bad actions, they exist in, in the society. The government exists. So the government is the, is the punishing mechanism. So they are the dangerous. They definitely not a positive stakeholder. They definitely a negative stakeholder for us. So they want our project to not break certain regulations. Well, at the same time, we can say that the government will will benefit because we will pay the taxes. So if our project is successful, then we bring money to the government. So maybe it's positive, maybe at the same time negative. I'm just now discussing how to analyze stakeholders. Option three, HR department. So HR department, they, they are maybe positive in some way because when you develop the software if it becomes successful then you're going to hire more people then you're going to get more job positions more headcount which is good for hr department so hr department will be more busy with more processes which more with more organization of the work that's good for them so they are sort of positive but at the same time they're negative so they may cause troubles to you they may damage your project by for example disallowing certain people to work or maybe they will tell you tomorrow that starting tomorrow everybody have to everybody has to attend the office eight hours a day so you were working remotely for example before and in some kind of a or in some kind of a hybrid mode but now HR department tells you, no, you're going to work only sitting in the office. So in this case, you may lose some people. So maybe some people may just quit. Or let's say you want to increase the salary for somebody who did some great job. And you go to HR department asking for this, for the bonus or the, the salary raise. And they tell you no. And you lose the engineer. You lose the person. So they are, I believe, more negative than positive. So the only stakeholder which is 100% positive is amazon web services they absolutely have no interest for your startup to fail because you host their servers there they only want you to succeed they only want you to uh, to become bigger and that's how you bring more money to them so if you compare these four stakeholders it's obvious that this one is the least dangerous they are on your side all these three uh, entities they are to certain extent they are against you and i would say that maybe the negativity goes this way so i would say that this probably in most cases is probably the most dangerous very unpredictable because in case of government in case of hr department these people are driven by business interests they're driven by rules they're driven by some some reasons some logic in case of a friend in case of people who pretend to be your friends who pretend to be interested in your success uh, it's hard to uh, underestimate their uh, their potential jealousy or potential just uh, unmotivated uh, negativity. So this is about motivation of stakeholders. So you need to think why these people are negative, why these organizations are potentially negative, why stakeholders are negative while they can be positive in, in, in your imagination. Uh, yeah, that's a good comment that it's true that Amazon is your positive stakeholder until they have some some product which is which is their own product. But even in this case, even if they create this crypto software, you still continues to to host your servers on to host your product on their servers. But of course, yeah, in this case, some negativity shows up because they become your competitors and maybe they will start causing troubles to your servers. So, well, it's hard to imagine because we believe that Amazon is an honest company, but we still need to consider this as a risk. So the Amazon, if we build a competitor of Amazon and we host our servers on Amazon, so probably they will be a little bit motivated to, you know, to, to be not so positive about our, about our servers, to be not so, cons not so, uh, maybe not so effectively supporting our uh, our hardware there. Um, another question you're asking, what if there will be a failure in Amazon and some services on which we rely will not work? Can this be potentially negative from stakeholder point of view? No, 
Amazon may have problems. Amazon may fail to provide the service which we're looking for, but still they are motivated positively. So they are positive stakeholder. Of course, any positive stakeholder can uh, be the, the cause of the risk. So let's say I have a, a friend who is 100% my friend and the friend supports me and let's say gives me money to my startup. So of course this person is interested in my startup to succeed, but I don't know, a friend may run out of money. And in this case, I have no more money. So there will be a negative effect because of the money coming from the stakeholder. So don't mix these two things. The, the, the stakeholders, they're positive or negative because of their motivation, because of their interest. But the risks which are associated with the stakeholders, they could be positive risks or they could be negative risks. Remember the risks, we have uh, positive risks and we have opportunities. So when you identify your stakeholders, then in front of every stakeholder, you may write risks. So let's say you had, you identified your stakeholder, a friend, you know, a friend, a friend wants to help you. Now let's go risk number one associated with the friend. What may happen? I don't know. A friend, let's say he's positive stakeholder. Let's say, let's start from the negative. Let's say we consider this, this guy as a negative stakeholder. So we assume that the motivation is negative. So we assume that he's jealous about us even though now he looks like a friend, but me, he may become jealous in the future and he will, uh, I don't know, he will, what he can do. Let's say he will, uh, he will, I don't know, steal our software and, uh, and sell it to competitor. I'm, I'm, I'm improvising here. So of course we believe, we, we should believe that this is not going to happen with a friend, but still it's a risk. A risk means may steal. So we say may still, this is the key word for the risk identification, may. Risk number two, in this case, let's consider that this stakeholder is positive. So now we describe the opportunity. So let's say the friend may get rich somehow one day and invest into our startup. May get rich and invest into our startup. So what do we do? This is two risks we identified. Remember risk, ident risk management we discussed before. So this is our risk and this is our opportunity. Opportunity. What do we do with the risk? We try to minimize it. We try to mitigate the risk. So we try to build a response plan. So what should we do in order to prevent our friend potentially stealing the software? Well, let's not give the access to the software to the friend. Let's be friends, but not give access to our servers because we're friends. We're not, we're not co-workers. Good. This is the mitigation plan. And how can we, uh, um, how can we promote, increase the possibility of this opportunity? Well, let's, while working on our startup, maybe let's help a friend develop his own startup a little bit in free time. Then there is a chance that the friend will get rich in his own business and give money to my business. That's how you exploit the opportunity and mitigate the risk. So, that's the idea. So you identify stakeholders and then from the stakeholders, you derive the risks associated with them. Question six, uh, what we care least of all about a stakeholder. So when you identify stakeholders, you need to know many things about them. If you do it formally, if you do the project management of a large scale, then you get a list of stakeholders and in front of everyone, you uh, you identify many, many things like the name of the stakeholder, the location, the, the phone number, the, what, what's, what, what's my relationship with this stakeholder? What is the interest of this stakeholder? So what they're interested in, this is my friend. He's interested in me being rich or interested in me being not rich, or this is the government. They are interested in me first paying taxes, second, not violating any laws and so on and so forth. So in front of any stakeholders, so this is stakeholder number one, you say their interests, there are many of them, there could be influence, um, probably you don't need this, we have it. Um, so you have the interest, interests, there could be many of them, they may be interested in different things. Like I said, the government is interested in you paying taxes, which is a positive, uh, positive role of this stakeholder. And at the same time, the government wants to put you in jail if you break the law. So they have two opposite, two interests, which are at the same time, positive and negative. Influence, it means how much they can affect us. So the government is pretty, pretty, pretty influential stakeholder. So if they decide to put you in jail, 
they do it. They, they know how to do it. Uh, and the friend, if the friend decides you decides to, I don't know, to, uh, to, 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 to cause some trouble to you, the influence depends on many factors. If, there's, if, the, if the friend has access to your source code, then the influence is high. If there is no access to source code, then probably a friend cannot do so much about the source code. So influence, we also need to estimate how influential is the stakeholder, how much help and how much trouble they can give you. Ideally, in some numeric values, like try to calculate it in, in monetary value, in, in, in money, like how much money they're going to they're gonna cause, how big is the trouble, and at the same time, how much help they can provide. Legitimacy. So whether this influence this connection with the stakeholder is uh, legit is it a is it a, uh, a legal uh, like for example with in case of a friend a friend can steal my software it's not a legal uh, connection it's it's more like illegal i would put it this way but in case of the government if the government wants you to uh, to abide uh, the laws then it's very legitimate and very legal uh, connection so they will most probably uh, they will most probably uh, very, they will be very persistent in in enforcing their interests if they are legitimate if this uh, expectations if their interests and if their uh, desire to make you have make you successful or unsuccessful is written somewhere on the paper then uh, that's a that's that's important factor to consider imagine let's get back again to the example with the uh with the doctors who are uh, not very interested in people inventing uh, one simple pill to cure cancer uh the doctors may some doctors may be very much against this pill but this is not a legitimate interest of the doctors they will never even declare it publicly most of them most of them they will say that that this pill is is great even though subconsciously and uh, uh, they have a, a hidden agenda according to which they will try to prevent your project to succeed so we need to consider whether the stakeholder is legitimately is is, is legally uh, the interests of the stakeholder are legal or uh, or not and Number four is location. So where they are located. They may be located next to you, next door. They may be located in another city. They may be located in another country. I believe that this is the right answer to this question. We don't really much care about their location right now in these days of internet and then remote work. So these three factors, they are important. We need to care about that. How big is the interest? Like what are the interests? We need to care about the influence. We need to care about legitimacy. But location, it's not important. Just, just consider these three. Not only these three. You can read PM Book, and you will see there are many other things that you need to care about when you deal with a stakeholder. But let me emphasize again: identification of the stakeholder is eighty percent of your uh, of your stakeholder management, or maybe even ninety percent. As soon as you know who they are, you are uh, you are safe because it will be clear in most projects it will be clear who are you dealing with you will you will see who are these people you will understand if you know these people you will understand what they want so this so much detailed identification of their interests of their influence and so on it's for large very large projects for your projects where you will work and where you work right now that's enough just to identify them just to make a list of them Question seven, a client gets hysterical and demands project termination, a very typical situation. Most probably, what did you do wrong? Well, of course, now we know that what you do, did you do wrong, you did something wrong with the stakeholder. The client is a stakeholder, so you somehow didn't do something for the client. So didn't hire the right people, definitely not an option here. So it's not about hiring right people or not hiring right people. It's not about the failure of the project. The failure of the project should have been predict should have been um, uh, expected by the client so if the client already is hysterical if the client is already demands you see that i, I just uh, emphasized the word demands it means that uh, something is broken in the in the in the so-called engagement of the client of the customer engagement means that you while the project goes forward you need to 
try to engage your the most critical stakeholders as much as you can into the work into the affairs of the project so they need to know what's going on they need to be involved we discussed this in the communications management if you remember where i said that uh, it's important to uh, to constantly um, to constantly communicate the status of the project to show it to the customer but just showing maybe not enough so you need to engage so you need to have the customer as close as possible to 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 your internal affairs of the project so the customer knows what's going on and will, knows what is your uh, prediction of the future like when the project will fail and if the customer knows when the project will fail they will not demand anything they will not get hysterical they will just know it up front and they one day they will just say you know as you suggested we close the project. That's going to be the message of the customer because they will see that we are moving forward at this speed. We know that this is amount of features will be implemented. We know that the project will not be able to complete before this important important milestone. And we know how much 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 money it will cost. And that's the conclusion at the bottom of the of the paper. Conclusion by the project manager. And the project manager says there is one percent chance. That the project will meet the deadline and you will have the product as you expected so it will be obvious to everybody that the client just calls you very calmly very uh, professional and say we made a decision just like you suggested according to the numbers you presented to us one percent chance i don't need to get hysterical i just decide to stop it that's it so if this happens the engagement didn't happen so it's not about hiring right people or wrong people that's completely irrelevant here you didn't push programmers strong enough. Well, it's also not about pushing anyone, any, anybody. We discussed that many times, that the job of a project manager is not to push anybody. The job of a project manager is to see how people work and then make a prediction about when they will complete the results. The, and, and, and then build some motivational instruments which will, which will help successful people to be even more successful and unproductive people, unsuccessful, to get out of the project. So that's it. So you don't need to push anybody. Your role is not to be a, a pusher. Your role is to, it's a completely different role like we discussed in previous lectures. So this is no. Didn't report status regularly. This is close. This is close enough uh, that you didn't report. So this information about 1% chance of completion was not delivered to the customer for some reason. So maybe you didn't report regularly. Maybe you reported, but they didn't see. But well, in this case, you say you didn't report. So this is a possible answer, but the best answer is his, is this one. You didn't invite the client to project meetings. So you didn't engage the client into the project, you know, tightly enough. Just reporting the status, maybe not enough. Maybe they didn't read it. Maybe they didn't pay attention to your numbers, like 1% chance. What kind of information is this? The majority of customers, they are not used to that kind of information from project managers. They expect project managers to be, uh, to be pushers of programmers. And, and, and that's, that's unfortunately how the, uh, the agile reality now looks, uh, that, that project managers are just the people who are who are pushers, who should, who should push and be responsible for everything. So when you just report the status in a, in a right way, how I teach you, they will not understand what you're doing and they will pay no attention. So your job is to get them into your process of, of project management. Just invite them to project meetings, maybe invite them to not project meetings, but just face-to-face -face meetings. Just sit, sit with them and explain them what's going on. Engage them closely. This is important for positive stakeholders and your customer is definitely number one number one positive stakeholder so for the positive stakeholders you talk the engagement it's it, and this is about uh, personality this is about soft skills this is about being nice this is about being effective in human in, in human in communications human to human so here Forget about documents, forget about uh, proper planning, forget about risk management, identification, all the things which I, which I was teaching you for, for nine lectures. Here we're talking about uh, personal communication with people, just engage them. And that helps to turn positive stakeholder into even more positive. And, and, and that will help you to get help from the customer. Okay, and now the final question, number eight. 
um, when actively listening to a complaint of a client, so the client calls you, or maybe you're sitting in the meeting, which I just suggested to you. So you have a meeting, you talk to the client, and the client is complaining. Like, you know probably what is actively listening, right? It's just not listening and just, okay, like you're listening to me right now, probably, most of you. But active listening is when you demonstrate to a, a speaker, to, the, to your opponent, that you, uh, that you really uh care about what the, the opponent is saying and and that's uh, and that's important for you and that helps the opponent to deliver information to you better and to feel engagement so they they're gonna feel in the end that they are very well engaged in the communication and you got the idea so option number one smile they talk you just smile back well it it may look uh okay in some situations but in most cases it will look uh, very mm, uh, rude in my opinion so if the client is complaining so then why do you smile so what's so funny about it i don't think it's a right reaction to any kind of argument so in any argument you just in my opinion i'm not a psychologist but i suggest not to smile but that's not going to get you anywhere the client has a problem so your job is to is to understand what the problem is and 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 find a solution agree agree is not a good idea also because if you agree with the complaint it means that you did something wrong so my next step if i'm a client just fire you okay you agree with the mistake so pay for it so if i come to you as a client and i say your project is failing and, the, and we see that the, the pro programmers are not productive we see that they fail to deliver the software i'm not happy about it and you say i agree oh you agree so so refund me give me the money back if you agree so or what if you agree that you made a mistake then then the next step is punishment so give me the money so agree probably is not a good solution either for this kind of active listening explain I'm the customer, I says, I don't like the, how you move the project forward. I, I see that the programmers are lazy. I see that you promised me to deliver five features in a, in, 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 a, in a month, but you delivered me just one. I'm not happy about it. And you say, no, 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 let me explain. That's your answer. Let me explain. We actually delivered one feature, but it, it's, a, it's a big feature. It's more important than these five. This way, you only, I think, you're only going to make the, the conflict more aggressive. Because I have my own opinion about it. I say, well, you promised me five. Why didn't you tell me before? Why didn't you call me three, three weeks ago and didn't tell me that instead of five, you're going to deliver me one? I was waiting for five. I don't care about your reasons. I don't care about your explanation. You promised me five. So I'm expecting five. And now you're trying to play him again, tricking me and explaining that one is better than five. That's, that only makes me more angry. So expl explaining is not the answer either. The right way, I believe, is asking questions like, uh, like you just suggested in the chat. Asking questions is the best way to go through a conflict, through a verbal conflict. I, you don't agree with me. You don't like what I'm saying. Ask me, why do you think so? why ask me why why multi many times uh, uh ask me questions to help me explain my position better to you and if you're smart enough by asking these, these questions you will turn me into the, the the place where i will say well yeah maybe maybe i'm not so perfectly right like in this case you can say uh, uh i'm telling you you have to deliver you promised me to deliver five features but you gave me only one i'm super unhappy and you say why do you, I would, the question you may ask uh, on this, you may say, uh, but these five features though, all of them are very important to you. And the customer says, yeah, all of them, all five important. And you're saying like, can you please um, prioritize them? Which one was the most important? So you, again, you ask him and I'm saying, well, you're still not arguing with me. You're not making me more angry. I feel that you're my friend, so you're not becoming an enemy. So I'm saying, well, the feature number three was the most important. Feature number one was the least important. And I'm saying, well, um, what, what, what happened because we didn't deliver the feature, the least important feature? What, what happened because of that? Like, what, what's the consequences? And you're saying, well, we, because of this, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, get the money from, from, the, from the real users because, of, because the feature was missing. 
And I'm saying, okay, and uh, how much you got uh, because we delivered you another feature? You know, we delivered you something. So how much you got from there? And I'm and the, the client will say, well, that was that gave us some money. Okay, I understand your point. You see, so I am trying to convince the customer without telling, but only asking. And by answering me, the client will uh, will feel very safe. Will feel not attacked. When you ask, you don't attack. You just you just fetch the information. So still, the control, the power is on the is in the hands of a customer. I'm not trying to take the power away. I'm not trying to struggle. I'm not trying to turn our argument into a power struggle. Instead, I'm I fully admit that this is your power. You're the customer. You are in charge. So I'm here to work for you. But now I'm asking, asking, asking. You can apply this technique to any other arguments, to many other arguments which you have in your real life. Not only with the customer, not only not only with the with the professor, for example. With anybody, if you want to to get out of a conflict, to get out of an argument in a in a professional way, the best approach is to ask questions and forget about explaining, forget about arguing back, forget about delivering your point of view uh, in an opposition to what they just delivered to you. Again, I'm not a psychologist here. I'm just giving you a very uh, primitive. Uh, explanation we have a few more minutes let me show you something that will may help you in your uh, management of stakeholders in large organizations there is so-called uh, two types of organization of uh, two types of um, management um, of how the management how the structure in the organization may look like the first type of organization is so-called uh, functional organization when uh, the, the entire company, is um, broken into is is um, uh, decomposed into departments and each department does certain certain activity for example a department of programmers a department of testers a department of uh, hr a department of uh, devops so these are four departments and these guys the programmers they write code the testers they test the devops they 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 do the devops and and hr just just do the hr this is a pure so-called functional organization another type of organization is pro projectorized i don't know what's the right name but the the project driven organization that's a different story the organization is separated into four groups the first group they make the mobile app another group they make uh the web app the group number three, they make the web service. And the group number four, they make the internal accounting system. So there are four groups making four products. In each group, they have testers, DevOps, they have HR, they have everything. So this is project, uh, the organization which is designed, which is broken down, which is decomposed into projects. Two extremely different types of organizations. And there is a matrix organization, which is more popular right now. I guess most organizations in the world, most large organizations, they're matrix organizations, which means uh, the mix of these both types. So on this picture, you can see we have functional managers, functional, functional managers like manager of all coders. This is managers of all DevOps. This is managers of all testers. And these are the coder number one coder number two, coder number three. And this is the tester number one, tester number two, tester number three. And this is DevOps. This is Jeff. This is Mary. Let's say, you see, I like DevOps more. And this is, uh, let's say, I don't know, Anna. So these are three DevOps, three coders and three testers. And this is the project, project coordination. I see project coordination. So probably this is going to be the PM, the project manager, which is, I don't know, what's his name? Nick. So the project manager takes these people and makes a project and makes the mobile app. Mobile app. So the real boss of Anne, of Anna is this guy, uh, Peter. So Peter is the boss of Anna. So the Peter decides how much money Anna gets every month. The Peter decides how big is the bonus by the end of the year. Peter decides when to fire Anna when she's not performing well. So this guy can, of course, recommend something to Peter and can say, you know, Peter, Anna was very successful in my project. But at the same time, Anna participated in three other projects. 
and there were three other project managers and Anna was not successful in these three projects. So the Peter will put together all the recommendations coming from project managers and decide what to do with Anna. This is a matrix organization. It has uh, pros and cons, but this is the reality. So Anna has a number of stakeholders, a number of bosses. The real boss, the real boss is Peter, but Nick is also sort of a boss. So if Nick is not happy, then, then, then they, they will not, uh, the Peter was also not happy. So Anna has to work for three, four, five different bosses. So these are all stakeholders of Anna and she has to keep a balance between these stakeholders. She needs to understand, she needs to understand how to make all of them happy, or how to contribute to the success of all of them, how to make Peter happy and how to make Nick happy at the same time. And that's what makes matrix organizations so annoying sometimes, so difficult, so, uh, but at the same time, very stable. So matrix organizations are much more stable than functional organizations or projectorized organizations because so many connections. And if one boss is bad, which happens so often when people and people are not perfect. So very often you will see, you will get into a situation when one of your bosses is an idiot. But if you have four more bosses, if you have four more people who you also contribute to their success, then you can survive in that kind of organization. You just need to understand that one of your bosses, one of your stakeholders, uplink stakeholders, one is not so perfect, but the other four, are much better. So work with them closer. And this one, try to somehow neutralize, somehow isolate, somehow you know, stay away from this guy. That's how you, you balance your, uh, your, your power, you balance your situation in, in organizations like matrix organizations. So every time you get into organization, ask around, every time they, somebody hires you, try to understand what kind of organization you deal with. And if you see two people, three people coming to you and asking something from you, immediately understand that you are in a matrix organization and it's okay. So don't think immediately that the company, that the organization is, has a broken management because there are two, three bosses need something from you. Because in the classic management, we know that there has to be only one boss for every person. That's a classic, traditional, proper management. One person has one boss. You cannot have two bosses. That's a completely uh, broken idea and it breaks the idea of subordination because you cannot make two people happy at the same time and because there are conflicts between them, we discussed all of that. But in reality, they give us matrix organizations which are uh, which in, which uh, celebrate this uh, violation of the subordination principle. To survive in this organization is easier. The organization in general is more stable that's a separate discussion why and a separate discussion why we have this uh, this reality while while the classic traditional management knows that subordination is key uh, is the main principle if the if the management if the the, the group of people wants to survive in uh, survive through through difficult times it's a different discussion but this is the reality matrix organization is what you're going to get and one last slide before the homework. So that's a so-called power interest grid. It's just a funny picture. You, you, you may want to see it. I also took it from PM book. So if uh, on a horizontal line, you see the interest, uh, which is high or low. And on this line, you see the power. So if you can put in this matrix, all your stakeholders. So this is the stakeholder, 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 stakeholder. So if you find some stakeholder and you see that this stakeholder has very much interest on your project, but the power is very low. So this guy is very interested to make your project successful, but the power of this person is very low. So what do you do with this person? You keep the person informed, but you don't spend too much time. So these people are the people who you manage closely. If they have a lot of interest in your project and a lot of power. So these people are the people who you want to manage closely, who you want to talk every, let's say every day. And these people, you just monitor and these people will keep satisfied. This is the, the grid, which you may study yourself, how to deal with stakeholders. That's again, long separate discussion, maybe more suitable for psychologists, not for, for managers, because there are many different approaches. And finally, the homework for you. So you have something to do. Uh, I suggest you to uh, take your course diploma work, which we're doing right now, for example, with in this course, and make a list of stakeholders. 
and try to make it as long as possible and include both negative and positive stakeholders there. Organizations, people, me including, I'm also a stakeholder, the university, the other students, I'm just giving you hints, but try to make this list at least 30 entities. Just put 30 lines into this list or more. Just use your creativity. Think of who may be positive, who may be negative about what you do. And describe why they are positive and negative. Not just say this is positive, this is negative, but explain the interests. So why they are negative about your, your diploma work and why they may, may be positive about your diploma work. That's your homework. Try to do it. I guess it will be helpful. So that's it. Thanks for being in the course. We finished 10 lectures. That's all I have. To, that's all I had to say about management. I would be happy if somebody would tell me this when I was uh, a student, uh, before I started doing all the projects which I was, which I've done in my, in my career so far. Hope it was helpful. I suggest you to read uh, PMBOK as much as you can, but of course the latest version, the, the version number seven, not the, 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 the version which we were used in, which we used in this course, read the current one and um, happy managing. That's it.